By looking at each stage of development, Karen has evidence of how our ear bones evolved. So what's really surprising is if you look at these early opossum embryos, what you see is essentially a reptilian style ear with one ear bone. Those two extra middle ear bones, they're gonna be in the ear, in the adult, they are part of the jaw. And so the jaw joint between the, the skull and the jaw really looks like that of a reptile. And then after they're born and while they're growing up, those little bones that are gonna be the mammalian middle ear disconnect from the jaw. So they get relatively smaller and move up to their final position to become a mammal-like ear. So if you have modern reptiles with one ear bone, you have modern mammals with three ear bones. I think what the embryos do is they almost provide a link between those two. The idea that developmental stages going from embryos to adulthood strongly supports evolution as a concept of biology known as biogenetic law. Ernest Haeckel, the same man who was discovered to draw these fraudulent embryos that appear similar to each other, phrased this idea into three words. Autogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In layman terms, it means that the growth and development of an organism's life is a replay of the evolutionary stages that their common ancestors have gone through. The video you have just seen is a reflection of the biogenetic law. This evolutionist claim is one of the evidences to support evolution. Or does it really? Not exactly. The idea that a species growth and development can indicate evidence for evolution as a replay of their common ancestry has been rejected by some, believe it or not, evolutionists and pro-evolutionist sites like Evolution Berkeley, explaining that the appearance of the so-called ancestral traits are found to appear in inconsistent places. For example, Evolution Berkeley has it that the axolotl that belong to the common ancestor of salamanders with internal gills in the adult stage is found to appear without any internal gills. Well, the same is also true for marsupial mammals like the opossums. The jaw joint actually happens to be missing and not yet expressed at birth as highlighted here. It only appears later, right after birth. The so-called ancestral traits, therefore, seems to appear inverted rather than a replay of evolution. As for the evolution of the mammalian ear, originally it was thought to originate from a common ancestor of synapses and reptile animals, but eventually passed on over generations of descendant modifications going through those lineages. This line of reasoning is based on the homology of the three ossicle bones, the malleus, the incus, and the staves. Because the common ancestor of the two clades happened to have one of the three ossicles appearing homologous, the staves, it follows that the same ancestral ear has diverged to mammal-like reptiles and reptile animals, including birds. Those, it logically follows as a monophyletic trait, meaning the ear system is ancestral, sharing a common origin. On the contrary, there appears to be a gap in the fossil record that puts this into question. In 1975, an influential paper written by Allen reported that the tympanic membrane did not actually exist in the common ancestor of synapses nor reptiles. It also found to be lacking in st stem groups as well. He found that even though they had massive stapes, it seemed to play a role more on the jaw than it did on air sound vibrations. This means that the ear drums found simnasis and reptiles appeared independently, meaning that ears of reptiles, birds, and the ears of a million like animals do not share a common origin together that can be traced by the lines of common descent. If modern mammals, reptiles, and birds truly did evolve from a common ancestor with a tympanic ear, it would be safe to say that other structures like the external ear canal and tympanic membrane will form in the same way within those different groups. Unfortunately, that is not what the fossil record nor comparative anatomy actually demonstrates. One such characteristic that separates mammalian ears from non-mammalian amniota is the structure of the external ear canal. In one study, which involved mice and chicks, 
researchers were interested in studying its position and how it developed. What they found was that the air canal of chicks actually developed above the jaw joint, while in mammals like mice, it developed below the jaw joint. Here, there were two different developmental pathways that are in no way similar. Another interesting part that makes the, the extinction more profound is the positioning of the tympanic membrane between mammals and non-mammals. In birds and reptiles, the tympanic membrane is found to be supported by the quadrant. That is the upper jaw region, while in mammals, it is supported on the tympanic ring. That is the lower jaw region. What we have here instead is a great example of convergence independently appearing across different groups. While evolutionists like to point out to similarities like the three ossicle bones, they ignore differences such as the different positionings of the tympanic membrane and external ear canal. To argue that the evolution of the mammalian ear was transitioned from a single ossicle is therefore unjustified. Thanks for watching.